I guess we'll begin. Um, uh, so tonight, uh, uh, I'm going to cover Lakota star knowledge. And in our language, we say, we chakpi we choyake. So we chakpi is the stars, we choyake is the story about them and the connect our connection to them as uh, as we live here on earth among uh, our relatives. So uh, we refer to all the other entities here as oyate. So they are our nations. So there, there's, there's the Wahutopa Oyate, which is the four-legged, which is like the buffalo, the antelope, deer, horses, everything that moves with four legs, coyotes, wolves, uh, badgers, like animals like that. And then uh, there's the Zintkala um, Oyate, the bird nation, uh, the Wichachpi Oyate, the star nation. Uh, the Huahutka Oyate, the plant and root people, uh, the Cha Oyate, the trees, the nations of trees. Uh, so our connection, we lived, the reason we lived in harmony with them is we've always looked at them as our relatives and that we were no better than them. We were no higher than them. Uh, that we lived and that we understood that every spiritual and every living entity on this earth had a purpose and a reason for being here. And never as a people did we feel like we needed to dominate every, anybody, whether it be animals, whether it be the mother earth, whether it be the minerals. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, our people knew about the gold in this land, but it had no value to them. They, they couldn't make weapons out of it or anything. Uh, so it was just yellow metal and it didn't mean anything to us. And, and it's interesting how the Europeans came here and put a value on it and uh, made it a precious, precious metal above anything else, you know. Uh, so our ancestors uh, knew about the gold, but it didn't mean anything to them because they're, uh, they're, they didn't have a monetary system and uh, their value system was uh, based on, uh, based on uh, sharing and, and li uh, living in harmony with each other and with the universe. So, uh, we valued things above the gold, which was uh, animals and birds and water. Water was really important to us because water is life, you know. And so the dominant society came here and they brought uh, all of these different values, which didn't make any sense to us at first. And it still doesn't make sense to us, a lot of us to this day. So, uh, one of one is the the industry that uh, was started depending on fossil fuels, and uh, one of the things that is happening that we knew as a people was going to happen is uh, eventually these fossil fuels are going to run out. So the reason that uh, there it's getting so expensive is because it's harder and harder to uh, bring the oil and the gas is up from the earth, mother earth. So that's why it's so expensive. That's why there's uh, three, four dollars a gallon now close to. So, uh, and, and they, they've invented uh, solar powered cars, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's cars that run off the power of the sun. But uh, I don't know if you can uh, exploit that and become rich off of it. Maybe so, maybe not, but um, it's happening with the fossil fuel industry. But in as they drill and uh, bring this stuff to the earth, they're also destroying the earth. 
they're doing things like fracking that uh, destroys the uh, water table like this. So uh, in the greed for these fossil fuels, we're uh, wiping ourselves out as humans, as a two-legged. And uh, I think we put, we learn to uh, put, uh, I don't know, not so much the indigenous people, but I think we put too much of a, a importance on ourselves as humans, uh, thinking that uh, this world is not going to survive without us in it, which isn't true because this this world will thrive, it'll replenish itself. So, so if we're gone, we're the ones polluting the earth. So if we uh, if we ever uh, disappear off the face of the earth, this this earth will this earth will heal and uh, this earth will be uh, back to its original state. All of these things, buildings and everything eventually will uh, disappear, crumble and turn, turn to the, uh, back to earth eventually. Even the plastics and all of this will eventually be gone. It might take thousands of years, but it'll happen. Uh, so um, in talking about this, we talk about how we talk uh, one of the central beliefs is that uh, what is sacred in the sky is sacred on the earth. So Mahpia Ikta is pointing is the heavens, and then down on Mother Earth where we live, uh, we we feel we know that there is a connection between the two. Uh, so you see this teepee here that symbolizes the universe, what is in the sky and what is in the earth. So when we lived in teepees, it symbolized uh, the universe. Uh, we Within our dwelling of our home, uh, there was the symbolism of the universe, which is how we survived long ago. So we would tie uh, offerings, tobacco offerings, to the top of our teepee poles and make prayers uh, with it, and then uh, raise them up and uh, fish, finish setting up the teepee. So our homes were blessed long ago in that way. So uh, the hourglass figure, it has a word in our language and it's called kapemini. So kapemini means this uh, uh, figure here. So you'll see a lot of this, this design on a lot of our beadworks, our beadwork and uh, like shields and uh, quill work. Uh, designs like on pipe bags, on vests, on uh, different things, uh, parflesh bags, um, and it what it represents is uh, what is sacred in the in the skies and the heavens is sacred on earth, and we learned this from the buffalo people because we followed the buffalo for sustenance, but we were not as spiritually attuned. To this universe as was our four-legged brothers, the Pte Oyate. So um, we, um, we all, all these thousands of years, we uh, followed the buffalo and they gave us sustenance. They gave us clothing, shelter, and food, and tools. And then only recently uh, did we go away from this. When I recently, I say, Within the last uh, 150 to 200 years, we've gone away from this. Maybe 150 years, we've stopped depending on the uh, buffalo. So, um, so we followed them for the sustenance, and then we found out that they were going to certain sites on Earth at the same time every year. So through the holy men, uh, we learned that uh, they were following a spiritual calendar. Uh, when the sun passed through a certain constellation in the heavens, then they went to uh, the corresponding uh, sacred site. Mm -hmm. So there's a story, there's a word in our language called wo'okachnire, and it's uh, translated as uh, understanding. So the medicine, medicine men say that how deeply each of us understands the stories tells us about the level we have attained in our own lives. So um, when we talk, when the medicine men talk, and when we talk as Lakota people, uh, each story has a lesson within it. And each word has a concept within it. 
So when if I was to tell you all of this story in Lakota, uh, 99% of you would not understand what I'm saying. But only maybe 1% would understand what I'm saying. But yet, if I tell in English, you'll get a different level of understanding than if you did in Lakota. Uh, the person that understands Lakota will get a different meaning on what I'm saying. Uh, maybe because these are the stories of our people, then they would get a deeper meaning than what I'm telling in English. So this is what the medicine men talk about. So the stories are really important in the history of our people. And what is even more important is the knowing the language. So when we lost our language, the old people say, they took away our tongue, literally like pulling our tongue out and cutting it off because we could not talk the language. And I always uh, tell people that when you speak the language, you use different muscles in your tongue. So I did a, um, I did a um, historical trauma training all in the Lakota language. And there was Lakota speakers in there who added to the, uh, the different stories and concepts and what we talked about, what happened to us as a people. And for the people that understood the language, they said that it was very healing to them because a lot of them, when they heard words in English, because they weren't very well educated, uh, it didn't make sense to them. But when they heard it in Lakota, it made sense to them. So what happened to us at Wounded Knee when our people were killed? Uh, if I tell that in English, uh, different people will understand and different people, it'll touch them in a different way. But if you hear the language, and if you hear the story in the Lakota language, then it'll touch you in a different way. So when I told the story of the massacre and the story of a man named Dewey Beard or Iron Hail, uh, and what he witnessed there, and I told it in Lakota, the people, the people sitting there that knew the language, it brought them to tears. They were crying. To hear it in their own language and the concepts within that language, it touched them in a different way. And of course, the people that don't understand the language, it didn't touch them in any way because they didn't know what I, what I was saying. So when we talk about these stories, the woke is important. So what did you get from this story? What did you learn? Uh, what is important that is our young people get this language back so and relearn the language and relearn the concepts and what's between what's inside there so that they can heal from their own trauma and from the historical trauma. So the stories are important, but they have to be told in Lakota. And in my dream is that someday our young people will speak the language again. So they could hear the language, language and they could hear the stories in their own language and understand and get healing from it. So the concept of Mothpea Takia, to the heavens. So oral history with the Lakota will teach us that nomadic cunning societies do not ignore the heavens. Like many other societies on the move, the Lakota use the stars as a guidepost or when to move on from place to place in the Black Hills. So the star knowledge comes into play there is when um, the certain uh, sun goes through a certain constellation, then the buffalo move to a certain place, which is which corresponds with that, uh, that constellation in the sky. So they know they're attuned to when to move and the spiritual attunement of, of that, they understand it. So we learned it from them through the interpretation of the holy men. So why are they at a certain place at a certain time of the year? So the holy men found out it's because the sun is in a certain constellation. That's why the buffalo know. So we follow them. Also, our social... Uh, way the social structure of our people was based after the buffalo. 
because if you threaten a buffalo herd, they move, they move the uh, the calves, the small buffalo, the females, and the old buffalo into the center. The young bulls form a circle around the the uh, around the outside, and they get ready to defend their relatives inside that circle. So we learned that concept. So when we were threatened, we would put the elderly, the children, and the um, the old people, the elderly, the children, and the women in the center, the ones and the ones that were sick or infirm or like cripple, they were all put in the center and protected. So when General Custer fought our people, he knew that he learned it from his scouts uh, that how the Lakotas fought. So what he wanted to do was he attacked on the southern end of the, end of the camp with Major Reno in the lead. And his hope was to draw the, the warriors to the, to the eastern part of the uh, village. And then he was going to come down in the center and attack and try to capture the women, the children, and the old people, which is uh, what he did at the Ouachita River against the Cheyennes. And that's how he defeated them. But um, among the uh, Lakotas, uh, when he tried it and, and it almost worked, but uh, there was five warriors that held him off at Medicine Tail Coulee. These five warriors, there was three Cheyennes and two Lakotas. They hid behind these large fallen cottonwood trees. And when they sent, came through uh, Medicine Tail Coulee where the river was shallow. They tried, they were gonna attack through there, right? They, what they saw was the center of the village. But when they came over the hill, they realized that the center was still about uh, three quarters of a mile down the river. So he was actually still towards the Eastern part of the village. But because uh, he lost his element of surprise, he tried to attack anyway. And he was, uh, of those five, uh, warriors one of them was name was white cow bull and he was a, a half hunk papa half oglala warrior who hit sitting bull in the chest i mean not sitting bull but custer in the chest and he knocked custer off of his horse so uh, that stopped their advancement of their uh, uh, column so they must they would have probably made it into village and captured the women if he if that uh that warrior didn't stop him. So once he was wounded, they were without their uh, leader. So they, they went into a retreat mode after that. They're no longer on the offensive. They were in a retreat mode. So, um, so whenever uh, we moved, we've always followed the stars, the buffalo, and the spiritual calendar. This is how we move. So people thought that we just aimlessly uh, roamed around on the prairies and in the mountains without any direction or anything, but this wasn't true. So the first uh, ceremony that we do is um, is called Wanichoka. So the Triamni Chankahu, uh, the Chankahu of the Triamni, um, that is Washitus call it, or in a, in modern day astrology. Uh, they call it Orion's Belt, and it's the three uh, stars you see in the center here. So um, that's where the, the three Unchis live, the three grandmothers of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. And they came to Earth and taught us our language, the three dialects. Uh, and it, so um, whenever we set up the teepee, the three first three poles, um, is a tripod, you can see that. And it also represents these three stars. So um, so the sun reached its furthest point to the south on its ecliptic path, the Ampewi Trachanku. So it was time for the people to gather Chashasha, the red willow bark. And this is when we were in our winter camps. Um, the Lakota Oyate made offerings in their winter camps for the coming winter and also the spring, the spring ceremonies. So this is when they gathered Chashasha 
This is when they made their um, things for the summer uh, ceremonies, like their sacred pipes, their pipe bags. They quilled sometimes their buffalo robes, and then in later years, they uh, beaded them. Uh, their dreams upon these buffalo robes and then uh, sometimes uh, they would uh, make all the clothes that they're going to use to when they go on a vision quest they get the things ready for when they're going to sun dance they make their eagle bone whistles and uh, their piercing uh, sticks and all of these things are made during this time and so as they sat there and made their things the old people would tell stories the creation stories or the stories of our people like and the stories of past uh, warriors and chiefs that achieved uh, great things and they would tell the stories of the different battles and even a lot of stories about uh, what we're talking about tonight the star knowledge and their understanding of it So the Lakota Oyate make offerings in their winter camps for the coming winter. And then this is when they did the storytelling also. So the Kayamani has on the top of it is the head, Kayamani Pa. In astrology, uh, astronomy, they call it Pleiades. So the head of constellation, the head of the constellation, the animal. And they're not sure. There's some people that say it represents a buffalo. And there's some people that say it represents the womb of a buffalo. Uh, so that's when we have uh, uh, the travel to Black Elk Peak. It used to be Harney Peak, but we call it Black Elk Peak, Peak now. So it's also known as Wichinchila Shakoni, the seven little girls. So for instance, during the spring equinox, when the sun is in the dried willow constellation and close to the Big Dipper, the Lakota know it is time to travel to Black Elk Peak. And it is at Black Elk Peak, which is found in the center of the Black Hills that they hike to the top, conduct the pipe ceremony and welcome back the Sunders. This ceremony symbolically begins the season of renewal. So we believe that when the thunder come, they come as a strong force and they can destroy uh, villages and destroy people with their winds or sometimes lightning will kill people. Uh, sometimes tornadoes will come and destroy villages. So they made a prayer to the thunder people to ask them for pity and to bring a lot of rain so that the medicines and the different the grass and the sage would grow so the horses and the animals the the uh the buffalo and the deer and the elk and look will grow so uh, we pray we made that offering up there and this uh they say that these we change lashakoni the seven little girls they said were killed by an eagle but i asked my grandfather and he said no he said these were large bird-like creatures that uh, killed people long ago he said long long ago uh, he said they killed people so it was one of these that killed these seven little girls uh, so in modern times they have a name for them they call them a raptor but uh, we we call them unktehi came to kill us so that was our word for them for, for these raptors came to kill us is Unktehi. So the, uh, the story goes that this uh, raptor took these seven little girls and took them one by one to the top of uh, Black Elk Peak, or Ptehejota, as we call it. Oh, uh, um, is our name for it. In, in impersonating an owl butte, that's what we call uh, Black Elk Peak. Uh, so they changed the name uh, from Harney Peak to Blackout Peak. And uh, it was named after Harney, General William S. Harney, who massacred our people in Nebraska on the uh, Blue River down there uh, in Nebraska. Uh, they call it the Battle of uh, Blue River. But what happened was uh, uh, the, the men all left hunting, so they watched them, and they left, when the men left camp, then they attacked that camp, and they killed all the women and children and the old people. So when uh, this chief named Blue Thunder returned, 
all his people were killed. All his, all the women, children, and old people were killed. So they call it Battle of uh, Blue Water, but it was actually a massacre because these people weren't really armed or could defend themselves. So uh, it was kind of like really racist to name to me to to me it was racist to name this uh, sacred mountain after a man that uh, massacred our people. So I'm glad they changed it to Black Elk Peak because in his vision, Black Elk was taken by the spirit people to that uh, mountain and he was shown a vision there. So, um, so the, the story is that he took them, uh, the raptor took the young little girls to the top of that mountain and then killed them and their spirits went into the sky. So now on the, we say, we change the but the Washichus call it seven sisters. That's the constellation they call. They call they call it. So the the confusion and the loss of it was what happened to us in the time of uh, when our ceremonies were outlawed. We were not allow allowed to have our ceremonies by federal law. The Indian Offenses Act of the eighteen seventies um, eliminated. Uh, are not eliminated, but pre prevented us from doing our ceremonies. So a lot of this knowledge was lost because people did not pass it on. They weren't allowed to. Uh, they weren't allowed to because they were passed on because they're sacred stories. Uh, they were passed on a lot of times in the ceremonial setting, which is how I learned it too. And so, uh, uh, the, the, when the children were taken out of their homes and sent to boarding schools, then they did not hear the stories of their grandmothers and grandfathers. So when they grew up and they came home, a lot of those old people were dead and they took the stories with them. So there was an old man named Horse Looking who uh, knew a lot about star knowledge. So when they went to interview him in the 1970s, a man named Ronald Goodman wrote a book called Lakota Star Knowledge. And uh, he went and interviewed these old people. And he went to him and he asked him, he said, tell me the story of Triamani. Uh, and here he said, you should have came 30 years ago. He said, I can't remember now, I'm too old. And I'm forgetting and I forgot a lot of things. So that the true story, a lot of times they say is lost. Uh, and the confusion is, is this a buffalo or is this the womb of a buffalo? So among my Teoshpai, the Kiyuksa, we believe that it's the womb, the womb of a buffalo, W-O-M-B, a womb. Uh, in our language, we call it uh, Chayamani, but here they say Chayamani, but we say Chayamani. So, the womb has a head part of it, a backbone, and then a tail. Uh, so the chayamani is uh, the same chayamani that's inside of a buffalo is the same as in the human, how we, uh, how we see them. Um, so when we go to Black Elk Peak, then we pray and we welcome back the sunder, the Joaquin Oyate. So they're a nation too, the Sunder people, uh, just like we are a people. We are, uh, we chasha akantu, but we also are called the wahunupa oyate, the two-legged nation. So the, after that ceremony, then we go to a place called Preshla in midway, in mid-May, the spring had actually begun and a ceremony was performed, which welcomed back those life forms which had been prayed for at the equinox. So the ceremony was called the peace at a bare spot. In our language, we say, So they say that the different tribes that were even enemy tribes, when they, when they entered into this place, uh, the Lakotas did not fight them. And if the enemy tribe was there already and the Lakotas came, then they didn't have a battle. They allowed each other to pray in peace. And it was a place that was a symbolic of, of, of peace, how we're supposed to get along and live in harmony with each other, with nature and with each other. Um, 
So they say that's why it's called Okishlaya means uh, a certain place. Uh, and then El Wawahwala, so like Okishlaya would mean uh, a bare spot. So uh, like there's different places where like if you look up from the uh, satellite down onto, if you look down from a satellite onto the earth, you'll see uh, this area of Preshla, it's a bare spot within those of you that have been there know that it's a wide uh, area where there's no trees. The, uh, the hills are bare and it's uh, about 15 miles west of uh, Hill City up in the Black Hills. And the story is that <clears throat> whenever um, that young woman fell from the sky after she pulled the turnip uh, out in the middle of the Big Dipper and looked down to earth, she was once, uh, she once lived on the earth and she went up into the sky. Uh, she was taken by a young warrior who fell in love with her. So she wanted, she became pregnant and uh, from this young warrior who, who was a spirit and she got homesick. So he told her not to uh, pull the uh, turn up from that area, that, that piece of, of the constellation of the dipper, but she pulled it out and her, she saw the earth. So um, she braided Team Sila together and tried to climb down on a rope. And that rope, that rope of Team Sila broke and she fell to earth. And she was killed, but a little boy, uh, sur her little boy survived. So they say he's the first human that came to earth. So at Peshla, we have the ceremony where we welcome uh, the welcoming ceremony included feeding the plants by pouring water in the earth, scattering seeds for the birds, and an offering of tongues for the meat eaters. Also, at this time, people began to ready themselves for sun dance by fasting, by meditating or silence and purifications, meaning going into the sacred sweat lodge. Uh, so there also at the sacred place. Um, they have the um, they have the wiping of tears for all of the animals and all of creation at this place because we acknowledge their losses too, just like we have losses. Uh, in the past two days, I was at a funeral uh, on Saturday of a young lady that was killed, and then I was at, at a funeral yesterday for my grandson who was also killed. So two young people that died of violence, I went to the funerals two days in a row. So the, the losses that we have, uh, they have the losses also, the, uh, the um, animal people, the bird nations, the four-legged nations, uh, everything, insects, what crawls on the ground, what swims in the ocean or in the waters all have losses just like us and they they have they feel grief too they feel the loss they feel what we what we feel they go through it too they feel it too so after this this ceremony at Kheshla, then we gather at a mountain called Iyankaga. so after completing the ceremonies at the Pesh, at Kheshla, the people collected stones at Iyankaga in the Wyoming Black Hills and carried them to Devil's Tower or Ptehechota in our language to be used in purification in the purification laws during the time of the Sundance. So this mountain stands over by itself. And the, the story of how the Inipi came to us was, or the story is about, the, this is where we received the uh, ceremony of the Inipi. So before the coming of the sacred pipe, we had two ceremonies. One was the Humbalecha, the vision quest, and one was Inipi, the purification lodge. So this is, the people were sick, and a man had a dream to go to the top of this mountain and pray. So he took his um, offerings. There was no Chanupas yet in those days. So he took his offerings, and he climbed. Uh, we used to have tobacco that we grew and so he had his offerings in, tied in buckskin and painted with red earth paint. And he stuck his offerings in the ground and prayed up there, just wrapped in a buffalo robe. And the thunder came and they covered that mountain and they showed him how to make an inipi. 
a sweat lodge, how to uh, bend the willows in the ground and cover them with buffalo robes and then heat rocks and put them inside so that we could purify ourselves when, in times of uh, grief, in times of uh, sickness, in times of uh, mental stress or duress. Uh, we, would, we were told to go into these uh, sweat lodges and pray the inipi. Inipi means to make life within. That's what it is. So today, uh, people use sweat lodge because you do sweat in there, you perspire from the steam and the heat of the rocks. But it, people nowadays, even the ones that are without the cultural teachings will say sweat. I went to a sweat. And to me, it demeans the integrity of this sacred ceremony because when you can just sweat anything, you know, jump rope or run up a hill or something, you'll sweat. But uh, but they, they take this common everyday word to describe a sacred ceremony. And I've always taken issue with that. And I still hear it all the time. Even people you would think know better are people that think that they have the teachings and know the teachings of our people the, the, and the uh, um, different, uh, how would you say, it? the protocols, they still use that word sweat. I went to sweat last night. I've always taken issue with that. So when the when the when the sun is in the tipila, it's the the washitas call it Gemini. So the constellation is Bear Tipi. It is now called Gray Buffalo Horn, but the washitas call it Devil's Tower, and it's the place of summer solstice sundance. The sun reaches the farthest north on its ecliptic path. The sun passes farthest north over Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And then, uh, but we call it Pteje Jota, which means gray buffalo horn, or gray buffalo horn butte. Uh, before the coming of the Washichi, the white man, we didn't have a concept of the devil. He did not exist in our uh our worldview, our spiritual worldview, our way of thinking. He was brought and introduced to us by uh, the Washichus, the Europeans that came and their Christian teachings. But we did not have a, a, a devil. We just, the closest thing to the devil here was my brother-in-law's. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. So this is a picture of... Uh, uh, again, Devil's Tower, because if I say a lot of times we have to decolonize ourselves, and if I say something outside of Devil's Tower, no one's going to know what I'm talking about. But Pdehekota, so we got to learn to say Pdehekota for this place, Gray Buffalo Horn, Pdehekota. So it's a place of summer solstice, the Sundance ceremony is where we performed this at one time. So all of the Ocheti Shakomi would come here long ago and perform the We Wang Wachipi, the Sundance, at this place. So um, I'm not going to use that word no more, Devil's Tower. And in fact, I think there's a move among the native people now to change this name to Ptehejota uh, and get rid of Devil's Tower because we don't have a devil in our, in our uh, spiritual uh, view as a people. So the next is <clears throat> a sacred place is Tatuya Ihute, the source of all wind. So according to our creation stories, we emerge from the underground at this place, wind cave in the Chesapa. And according to my grandfather, the opening of this cave used to be bigger, but uh, over time, erosion and different things, the opening closed. Uh, smaller so but it was at one time when uh when it was bigger that people could move in and out of it walk in and out of it now but uh so the story is that uh wichasha uh which means first man came out of this we went into uh, the uh black hills to during the great purification and we went into there to survive because uh, there was a great flood that covered the earth. 
So we went inside of here to survive. And uh, the first man, Michasha Tchukahe, uh, came to the entrance and here an Iktomi spirit changed, changed himself to a man, and enticed him on the outside and showed him how cooked meat tastes. So uh, he tasted it and liked it. Because before that, when we dwelled under the ground, we lived by roots. We ate roots and that's how we lived. That's how we survived. So he tasted this meat and he took a piece of it down and the, the people down below um, tasted it and they liked it. So he said, I'll show you where I found it. And he brought it back up. So he brought all these people up to the top. So this Iktomi showed him how to fix this, uh, this how to cook the meat. And that's how uh, we stayed on top. Uh, so we checked, we came, uh, became what they call the Wichasha Akantu now. So we dwell on top of the earth instead of inside the earth. So our word for ourselves in uh, ceremonial language is uh, Wichasha Akantu. And then the spirit people that dwell uh, above us and sometimes among us is Wichasha Akantu Shni, we say. People that are not uh, of, of us, people that are not from above on top of the earth. So when you refer to yourself, uh, as a Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, or, uh, and I'm sure the different tribes have their name for themselves. But we are called, we call ourselves the Wichasha Akantu, means the people on top of the earth. So we have the seven Lakota virtues, the Wawakwala, the Woksape, the Wachantogunanka, the Wawachintanka, the Wawohitike, the Waohola, the Waonshila. So uh, we, we, as human beings, we must dwell in humility, we must dwell in wisdom, we must dwell in generosity, we must have fortitude, we must have bravery, wa'ohola, we respect for each other, wa'onshila, uh, which is care and compassion for each other. The reason it says I put kin respect under there is wa'ohola is the first respect that we show is to each other in our families and our teoshpai. Uh, and then then the people in general, we, we showed we always show them respect. Respect. But it starts at the home, the teoshpai, and then to the outside. So the dipper plays a part, the big dipper in the sky. So we call it Wichaki Hapi. So it carries the water for the celestial purification ceremonies and to ferry the spiritual essence of deceased people to the Milky Way. So you see the picture of the dipper down there, the seven stars, but they're also connected to uh, these seven stars. These seven stars and this dipper in the center, or each star represent one of these virtues here. So when we use it in the Inipi, it's, we're using that same um, uh, dipper in the sense that uh, we're using it to uh, use the water to pour on the stones. And so it's this comes from the book uh, by Ramal Goodman, the Lakota Stornowder, 1982. So he passed away since then. Uh, this man, this gentleman. And then we have the Tiikja. So Ronald Goodman notes that the tipi shape also mirrors the heavens, the three poles for the North Star, seven poles for the cardinal directions, two poles for the ears equaling the 12 months and the 12 stars, the morning star, the seven in the dipper, and three in Orion's belt. So it comes out to seven, seven uh, seven uh, stars, seven poles. And then you add the other three from Orion's belt and there's 10 poles. And then the two for the, what they call the ears, uh, uh, two poles for that. So it all together equals 12 poles. So the average dwelling, which was about the, about the size of an 18 uh, foot teepee, which you see a picture of it here, it was, they used 12 poles. But if you go to a bigger teepee, like a 24 or 28, then you would use 16 poles. So they say, taku top to waka. Four times four is 16. The 16 sacred spiritual entities within our, our creation story. 
So this is a star map here of um of the constellations and run, running around all of it is the racetrack. So uh, this represents the racetrack around the Black Hills where the animals and the birds raced and where a magpie raced for us and him and the, uh, buff, a buffalo was running. They were the only ones left circling and racing and all that, a lot of the animals died. That's why this racetrack, you see it from the sky, this racetrack is red. So and that's why you see it. it's red because of the blood is from the, their nostrils, their, their lungs hemorrhaging and the blood from their hooves left the ground red. So uh, at the end, right at the end, this uh, magpie was riding on a buffalo, kind of resting and letting him do the running for him. Then right at the finish line, he crossed the magpie. So he won for the humans. So um, now we we eat the buffalo for survival or we ate the buffalo for survival. But if the buffalo won and beat the magpie, then the buffalo would have ate us. So uh, how is that possible? One of my students said that in a class. So when I told him this story, so I said, we might've all died, uh, perished. I said, all the two legged that we trashed our country and we would have turned to grass. I said, and so the buffalo would have ate us. I said, because our bodies went into the earth and turned to grass. Grass would grow up through our bodies and then our bodies would turn to earth and grass would grow from us. And then the buffalo would eat us. So that's scientifically, you could look at it in that way, I told you. So in the last days of the chief red cloud, uh, they came to him in 1903, the government, uh, to have a meeting with him. So he told him that the supernatural powers had given to the Lakota, the buffalo, for food and clothing. We told him that where the buffalo ranged, that was our country. We told him that the country of the buffalo was the country of the Lakota. We told him that the buffalo must have their country and the Lakota must have their buffalo. So the reason this was important to our people is that because of the spiritual significance of the buffalo, and how they taught us the uh, star knowledge and the spiritual calendar is, is what he's talking about is that we need them for spiritual reasons, but also to survive as a people. By eating their flesh, we were eating uh, medicine because these, the buffalo, when they graze, they eat the medicines that grow on the ground. And so it goes through their bodies and goes in their flesh so that that's why to us, uh, buffalo meat is sacred. We're eating the same medicines that they eat, but we're eating it through their flesh. So, and it's also one of the healthiest uh, things that you could eat as far as like a meat product because they're, it's low on cholesterol and it's lean. And it's interesting because last week I went to a meeting of bison growers that live here in South Dakota. And there's also, there was some natives there, including myself. And we came together with these uh, non-Indian people that grow buffalo and they kind of have the same worldview as us. Uh, one of the things is that 50 million buffalo roamed at one time on this continent and they never, they never produced greenhouse gases. They never damaged the ozone layer. But all of the cattle that's around the world, they give off, these cattle give off greenhouse gases, which damages the ozone layer. So the ozone layer is, uh, that's along with uh, motor vehicles and exhaust, carbon dioxide. But uh, so what is it that tells you a lot about these cows that when they emit, emit this uh, from their, um, their waste, their body, bodily waste, they emit, emit these um, uh, greenhouse gases into the sky that damages the ozone layer. And, and uh, yet these buffalo lived here for thousands of years, 50 million of them or more, uh, they, they don't affect, affect uh, um, the environment in any way. So it, somehow those ranchers, uh, even though they're non-Indians, uh, understand that you know the value of it so uh, their their hope is that every 
rancher gives up their cows and starts uh, raising buffalo, which will never happen because uh, you can't really like profit off of a buffalo other than probably the price of his meat. But uh, a cow will eat and eat and eat and eat as long as you feed it. But a buffalo will only eat so much till he's full or he feels what is enough. So uh, you, ever, you ever look at them, they're lean. They don't, they don't overeat. And they're, they're smart enough not to keep e eating even if you feed them. So uh, that's my hope someday too, is that, that the buffalo come back and there'll be 50 million of them again here and there'll be no cows. So that ends my presentation on the uh, star knowledge. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Lakshi. Do you have somebody that you would like us to close? Hopefully, oh, Lakshi. Oh, mm. let's see.